Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Luigi. I work at the uh, uh, Technical University of Munich, and I'm here today on behalf of the Legend Collaboration to to present the our uh, software stack, the software stack that we are writing. So I start first with a couple of slides about the, the context. So uh, Legend is a neutrino double beta decay experiment searching for the decay with enriched germanium. So I have a sketch here on the right of the concept of the experiment. So the, the we are using um, germanium detectors, which are enriched in germanium 76, which is the decay candidate. So at the same time, uh, a source, let's say, of the decay, the signal and the detector. We have these uh, germanium detectors arranged in an array at the core of the experiment. They are submerged in a liquid argon tank, uh, which is equipped with instrumentation in order to read the scintillation light that is produced. And at the same time, of course, the passive shield against external backgrounds. And all of this is, again, inside a um, water tank that, that, again, is a passive and active shield because it acts as a, a water channel of veto. And uh, together with the some scintillating panels at the top of the experiment makes up the muon beta of the experiment. So a um, couple of words about the, the sort of event signatures that we uh, expect to see in this sort of experiment. So at the left here, you see uh, what signal-like interaction looks like. So uh, that will be to decay isolated. It's a well, it's very well located energy deposition in a germanium detector. Uh, other backgrounds can cause the uh, pulse shape of the signals that we record in the detectors to look very different, let's say, from the single side event. And for that, it's very important that we apply pulse shape discrimination methods in order to reject these backgrounds. And finally, as I already mentioned, we can exploit the light emitted in liquid argon to tag a certain class of backgrounds. And this light is uh, again collected by the argon instrumentation. Uh, which and the detectors themselves consist basically of silicon mod photomultipliers, which are collect, uh, connected to uh, light guiding fibers. So uh, the timeline of experiment is, uh, let's say, um, at the moment uh, we have a first uh, first phase of the experiment, which we call Legend Two Hundred, which consists of deploying uh, two hundred kilograms of germanium in the same uh, prior staff infrastructure of the predecessor experiment, Gerda at LNGS. And the final phase uh, will be about deploying uh, one ton of germanium and, and reach a half-life sensitivity above uh, 10 to the 28 years on the um, neutrino orbital decay half-life. So at the moment, again, as I mentioned, uh, the, the first phase of experiment Legend 200 is taking data at LNGS and uh, uh, the commissioning so uh, it's been completed. We have 140 kilograms deployed, and I leave here a link to the um, uh, very recent report about the first results in terms of background and performance we reported at the Tau conference in Vienna. So, with that said, let's, let's go to the interesting part. So, the software stack of this experiment. So, we start, let's say, from uh, the, the situation with the predecessor experiment, Gerda Majorana. There we had C. Uh, totally, I would say, uh, root-based uh, software stack. It was unfortunately also closed source, not available outside the collaboration. And of course, nowadays, it uh, was really written a long time ago, and it was very hard to maintain. So the decision in Legend has been uh, to uh, redo everything from scratch and try to do it uh, better, I think. So the, uh, we, have, we decided to have a primary software stack and secondary software stack. We chose Python for the primary software stack. Of course, we have very good reasons to do that. And the idea of the secondary software stack, secondary software stack is going to be in Julia. Uh, let's say, and mainly we lacked as a sort of cross check of the reference analysis, but also a test bench for new technologies. And all of this is open source on our GitHub uh, organization profile. Um, so I have here a summary of the um, let's say the, the, the our Python package ecosystem that we have uh, right now on GitHub for data analysis. So this is a, a high level summary of all the things that I will uh, cover now during my talk. Um, so let's start with the data, uh, data objects and uh, IO. So um, we chose, we decided to define um, our, let's say sort of 
own uh, flavor of, of data model. We define the, we call it an abstract data model and implementation to the file format, this, this say, uh, in order, let's say, to ensure uh, long-term data accessibility and also to comply with fair data principles. This uh, data model is public, available on this website here. And again, together with the actual specification of the implementation of the data format into the file format that we decide. So the, the file format we, we decided to adopt for the binary data is HDF5. Uh, has very nice features. It's a hierarchical file format, just like root files. It's very efficient, efficient has parallel I.O. compression capabilities. Um, and also on top of that, it's portable, it's very well supported, and it's also very much transparent. It's really self-describing. Um, so on top of this abstract data model, we have uh, two implementations at the moment, one in Python and one in Julia, one for, uh, for software stack. So let's go then. About, um, so the, the the first then the package in Python that implements data format it's called Legend PyData OBJ. Again, this is a link to the uh, actual repository for the package on our um, GitHub uh, workspace. Um, it's again an implementation of these data objects in Python. Um, they say we're talking about mostly uh, types. Uh, classes and that derive from uh, either Python or NumPy classes, like array table, waveform table, and things like this. Plus, um, let's say uh, routines for managing the metadata attributes, HDF5 attributes, but also physical units, compression settings, and other convenience methods. So on top of that, of course, we implement then the HDF5 uh, IO for these objects and corresponding iteration routines. Um, so as, as I mentioned that an interesting feature of this uh, package that we are developing is that uh, we need in our application some custom lossless compression algorithms for, for our waveforms that we, uh, that, we, um, that we record in experiments and we have some custom algorithms that we also have implemented in this package and also hardware accelerated uh, through Numba if you're interested. I have here, for example, these are the two uh, may be interesting for the broader community uh, uh, encoding algorithms that we have implemented. But for the rest, I really invite you to have a look at the tutorial on Brian on uh, in Read the Docs and at, at this link here in green. So second interesting package from the point of view of data is uh, what we call uh, the DAC2 LH5. So LH5 is just a short hand for legend ATF5. Um, and it's a package that we use uh, to convert the digitized data that comes from DAQ and actually from various uh, DAQ file formats to HDF5. And um, the nice feature about this, this package is that the coding and the output layout of the decoded file can be completely controlled through a JSON configuration file. And also uh, supported some other um, features like uh, waveform uh, pre-processing, things like trimming, down sampling, and also com compression, as I already mentioned. Um, so again, I invite you to, to have a look at the tutorial for, for more information, more the details about that. Let's go now to the second very important uh, piece of the uh, let's say task in analysis task in this sort of experiment, which concerns digital signal processing. So uh, as I mentioned already, uh, we need we, we run a lot of pulse shape discrimination in this experiment. And as you would, you know, also germanium detectors uh, have an excellent energy resolution, but also energy resolution is a very important requirement for these experiments. So these two things together require really us having to deal with high resolution traces. And, and also actually a rather long chain of uh, DSP filters to analyze them that also often are also quite computationally expensive. So for all of this, we, we, we don't do the DSP online, we do it completely offline because we need also to reprocess the data set from time to time. And so all these traces are stored on this. And so the important thing that we need to achieve here is to be able to reprocess uh, our data sets really in order of days, time scale of days, because this we've seen in past experiment was really key to deliver time in physics results. So we need, let's say in Python, of course, we need now to think about a, a fast software solution. So uh, 
we implemented this package. It's just called the speed. Uh, and again, you find on our uh, GitHub workspace. So, and it's based on the idea that, that we stored waveforms in on disk in rectangular structures and separately for each data stream. So for each detector, say each stream in the experiment, as you can see an example here. So this is just a 2D NumPy array. So the, the, let's say the easy thing to do is to use a uh, number to hardware accelerate DSP filters on this, on this data, on the CPU in particular, at least for now. And so for really profiting from hardware acceleration and also NumPy broadcasting, on, on, on top of these uh, rectangular structures. And the, the very nice thing, of course, is that for, for people that already know number, is that uh, this is also very simple to, to, to implement on top of existing filter algorithms, as you can see here, for example, on the right. So the other also interesting uh, feature of this package is that uh, all the complicated ESP chains that have been already mentioned can be configured through a JSON configuration file, which looks like uh, this one on the right. It has very, also very nice uh, functionalities in order to achieve this complex, uh, to really define these complex chains. Um, it's possible to, for example, import external uh, universal functions or NumPy, um, for example, um, as support for physical units, can, one can do waveform slicing or fancy indexing. Uh, supports those optimization loops for some DSP filters and, and also other things. So this, I would say also, it's very interesting package for the community. I think outside legend maybe could be also a good candidate for affiliation with scikit-head. Um, finally, let's say we have a um, sort of master package, uh, which we call, we call PyGamma that uh, includes more high-level uh, software routines, for example, event building routines. Even though there's not so much at the moment, we're still in the phase of designing and implementing these high-level things. Uh, there's a lot of routines for data cleaning, calibration, optimization routines. Uh, there's interesting, uh, we were trying to develop a high-level uh, generic uh, data loading uh, routines for the, the, the data, at least in the, say, in the global concept that we have for how to store this data, so a tier-like structure. And uh, but more in general, we really use it for development, test of new, maybe components of the software stack that finally then end up into maybe a dedicated package. And it acts at the moment also as a sort of glue for the, um, the legend um, software framework. So now I would like to, to say also a couple of words about the data flow. So how do we manage and how do we orchestrate the um, data processing in legend? So I have here um, on the left, um, a sort of simplified scheme of the how, how this data processing a workflow looks like for this sort of experiment, which is a, a tier-like, say, experiment. So in which the data is, is organized into different levels, uh, subsequent levels, say, uh, tiers again. And, and then, of course, one, one proceeds in the processing sequentially uh, in, in this, um, through these tiers. So um, I show, I start here, I uh, hope you can see my pointer. I start here on the um, uh, lower left, for example, uh, we can imagine a stream of uh, physics data in this case being delivered by the duct of the experiment. So the first step is to convert it, this, uh, this data into HD5. And this goes into the what we call the row tier that really contains the waveforms. Uh, then this row tier undergoes uh, DSP. So again, we have a second tier with the output of the um, digital signal processing. And uh, uh, finally, also we have to apply calibration for these uh, uh, DSP outputs and eventually also get to uh, some, uh, let's say, event, layer, event level classifiers that, that we store in the so-called event here. Um, so one note is that all of this data layout is really uh, we, we design it in order to be really array programming ready. So all the data is stored on this uh, in a flat rectangular uh, data structures. So in contrast to event-based or jet data structures. Um, so what are the 
characteristics of this um, processing workflow. So we, um, we, we can achieve, achieve certainly a massive concurrency at the uh, file level because the, the DAC of the experiment delivers data in, into what we call cycles, so small files. And that is a first level of concurrency, but we also can uh, process uh, concurrently uh, different data, data from different streams, different detectors. But on the other side, we also need to manage the calibration uh, routines, uh, also somehow manage this feedback uh, between the calibration and the physics data and other optimization loops that we run, for example, in our DSP. Uh, so how the question is, of course, how to implement this, this workflow in practice. And what we, de we decided to use a tool is called Snakenake, which has been originally developed uh, uh, for, I think, biophysics, biological applications. And uh, it's, which is uh, it's very interesting for us because it's, it's basically something that follows the, the make. Uh, it has a make-like logic, so you can see here on the right, uh, one it really defines rules with inputs, outputs, parameters, commands, and it's actually a, um, an extension of Python. So it's, it's really a language uh, that, that one can write this uh, sort of snake files, they're called. And, and this, of course, for us means that it has very good integration with our existing Python uh, software tools. And, and the nice things, of course, that we offer is all a series of routines to uh, scale this to servers, clusters, and grids. And, and so we find it uh, really, really uh, useful and works really well with our existing uh, software stack. Metadata. So they say the requirements for meta the metadata system of, of this sort of experiment. Uh, so but first of all, uh, metadata, of course, I don't have to convince you that it's something that, that is needed everywhere in the, in the life of an experiment. Uh, metadata can come from uh, data processing, um, detector production, characterization, static information, hardware configuration, uh, slow control, etc. So what we need is for a format which is standard, documented, human and machine readable. We need for virtual control. Uh, we need a good distribution system. We, we need it to be accessible, easily accessible, especially from code. And also we need a system to define the validity of, of these metadata, for example, in time or category. So we decided to go for uh, a very simple implementation of this, which of course might not scale well with large uh, metadata systems, but at least works very nicely for us. And, and which is a, a, about organizing this metadata in a JSON file system. And this really means that we have a very transparent database and the specification is also available online. Um, so then we, we, we virtual control this uh, file system with Git and we distribute it on GitHub. Uh, also, these can be divided in several sub-repositories uh, by scope or responsibility, for example. And finally, we have, a, let's say, a sort of catch-all big repository that collects all these uh, sub-modules and so acts at the same time as uh, central uh, access or distribution point for the metadata and also offers the possibility to do a global versioning. And, and here in right, you see an example of okay, how that looks like. For, uh, for example, this is the, the uh, say global repository. Uh, there are uh, sub-modules about, the, for example, the configuration of the parameters from the data production. Uh, there is hardware information. Uh, again, this is for this validity file that you see here is what I was mentioning. Uh, it's, it's our way that we found to in a specification on the format to define the validity of metadata, etc. So how do we access this, uh, at least in Python? So uh, there's this package, it's called PyLegend Meta, which is partly legend specific, but actually not so much. Uh, would be interesting, I guess, at some point, maybe to make it available and less, less uh, specific to legend. Uh, basically offers then the possibility to manage the Git uh, revision of this system. Uh, there's this JSON DB object that is maybe the interesting part uh, for uh, for people outside the collaboration that represents exactly this JSON database, uh, which in memory is just a um, sort of augmented uh, big dictionary. Um, 
that can also offer, let's say, offers also uh, uh, routines and methods for, for example, query the validity of a certain metadata on other very fancy things like for us, for this legend specific, of course, for example, to offer offers a, um, an interface uh, with the remote uh, legends low control system, for example. So I have here also um, a short showcase of how this works. Um, I just mentioned that, of course, for th this is, for example, uh, what I was, um, what I meant with uh, dict like um, access of this uh, JSON file system, also by attribute, which saves some typing. And, and finally, also these routines again that, that um, for example, via date time object uh, allow users to select uh, the time validity of a certain method. But more examples, I uh, really encourage you to have a look at the uh, tutorial and do the online documentation. So finally, I wanted to say also a couple of things about the plans for the simulations of this type, which I haven't talked about until now. So we also have a sort of a specific workflow here for uh, producing the, the, if you want, the templates or the uh, probability density functions that, that we use for signal and backgrounds in the experiment that we use for our various physics analysis or background models. So uh, I, I won't go into the details of this scheme here, uh, but I just wanted to communicate that somehow this is also a complicated scheme, uh, but basically it goes from at the top here from uh, running some GM4 simulations uh, that of course uh, are say uh, informed by a certain geometry model then this, the output of this simulation is usually post-processed by separate dedicated tools that fold in or certain uh, other things like the optical response of the experiment, the, the how germanium detector work, um, hardware configuration parameters. And this eventually then goes into producing the probability density functions templates that go into several, um, let's say, uh, physics models or, or analysis. So one thing, of course, I mentioned Gen4. So of course, this is very much Gen4 tight. But uh, let's say differently from the past, uh, we're thinking about what to do, how to improve uh, there, and also how to do that uh, in Python with the new software stack. So one one certain simply one uh, problematic point about this whole uh, pro whole workflow, let's say, is that the most of the time when uh, developing these geometries, these, these simulations, sorry, uh, the, the, the thing, the task that takes most time is certainly the development of geometry itself. And uh, of course, in particular, because in, in the context of legend, there are many setups to simulate, um, experiment, uh, realizations, test stands, uh, so a lot of code to write. Uh, certainly C++ is not the, the best language to do that and, and neither GTML for large geometries. And of course, one would like us to try to do new things like, uh, for example, reusing CAD models, uh, uh, etc. So the idea here is that uh, we, uh, the idea is that we could keep the amount of C++ code to the minimum by developing uh, a sort of geometry agnostic uh, Gen4 application. That, again, does not contain any uh, geometry code and use different tools to develop the geometries. In particular, we want to use uh, this, call, this tool called PyGeometry. You will hear a talk tomorrow uh, about this, actually, so I will not go into the details to develop these geometries in Python. And then the interface to GN4 would be GDML. Uh, so at the moment, we are developing this software stack. And I have here a list of links, if you're interested. Uh, the repository for simulating germanium detectors, uh, optical properties of the experiment, and the actual setups. So this is going to be, say again, a sort of sub-component of the simulation software stack dedicated to uh, developing all these geometries in Python. Finally, uh, there is also uh, a lot of, let's say, uh, automation that is needed here to orchestrate this huge uh, simulation production chain. And again, here I just mentioned that we decided to use, uh, again, to go with SnakeMake, which is, works very well. Uh, 
uh, and uh, so there this whole uh, simulation production chain I've been talking about, so really from running the simulations to the final fit templates is also automated with with uh, automated with SnakeMake and is available open source on our GitHub. Finally, let me just mention that uh, briefly that of course we are also trying to do our best in terms of software development practices. So we try to uh, learn from the community. Uh, do things the, the right way. So we're trying to adopt modern packaging practices. We use pre-commit, uh, unit tests, code coverage. Uh, we try to be good at documentation. And uh, all, all the packages that we've been talking about today are available on PyPI. And we have a, a very much, uh, let's say, well, very nice uh, pipeline of deployment uh, with GitHub Actions that really that does not require basically any user intervention. And with that, I'm right at the end of my talk. So it's a summary, which I'm going to skip. Uh, but, but actually, let me just mention, let, let me go through it. It's important. So uh, so all of this that I've been showing you today is, uh, is sort of functional, but we're still working on commissioning uh, all the pieces. And so of course, the, the software stack is expected to grow in the near future and to include more high level uh, tools and analysis. Um, I think there is a strong interplay, clearly there is a strong interplay with the other uh, energy physics community packages. And uh, also I'm sure that, that somehow this, this interplay will become stronger and stronger in the next years. And, and I hope also that some of the development that is done internally to the collaboration can also reach out to the community and potentially be interesting for other experiments. So that's it, thanks. Uh, fantastic. Thanks very much for that nice talk. Uh, this was, uh, I think, very cool to see. So, <laughs> um, so I think we have uh, given a, some small schedule changes, I, even though we're basically at time, I think we still have time for maybe one or two questions. Um, so I'm going to go to chat, although I think we also, I saw a, um, uh, I saw a question from Jim Pavarsky. Uh, so Jim, do you want to, uh, that was asked in the Slack channel, but Jim, do you want to ask that uh, also on, on Zoom? Sure. Okay. Um, I asked it on the Slack channel because I think that it could lead to a longer discussion, but um, uh, seeing your data model uh, would fit uh, awkward array rather well. Uh, I was interested in knowing um, uh, if you'd like to provide a view of your data as awkward arrays. Uh, and in particular, uh, um, use Python primarily and Julia uh, um, also. Um, that's about the same level of, <laughs> of uh, um, awkward array is primarily Python. And very, very recently, we've uh, uh, developed a uh, Julia port. So it could be interesting to see how uh, uh, if if that could be used in your um, uh, in a framework. I mean, of course. I mean, the, let's say the data model, as you see, has been developed in order not to be language type or language specific. So, of course, when we thought about this, we had in mind the idea that that of course that would work for Python, for Julia, and whatever. Uh, so as, as as I mentioned, the so we try at least on disk to go for where is it? So on disk, we really um, let's say have everything. Everything we write on disk is really I would say uh, right here flat, so rectangular uh, data layout. I mentioned that this sort of uh, oriented for array programming, as I, as I said. But of course, then uh, in memory that could be completely different and. So one piece that we need to design now will come in the next uh, months is uh, some data loading code that takes all this data from all the different years together, depending on a certain user selection, and loads them into memory in the right format. With, of course, for example, I can anticipate for a sort of event-oriented, so uh, data format will absolutely be something like uh, awkward arrays. Um, course. So from this point of view, uh, absolutely, we, but certainly now thinking about inter integrating this, uh, let's say, jet 
uh, array and uh, technologies also for, for handling these data, um, particularly, I would say, in, in memory. Okay. Yeah, uh, let's let's follow up because uh, maybe we could, uh, on the awkward side, we could look at some of these HDF5 files and see how to use uh, Octot from buffers in order to load them efficiently. Yes, yes, that, that, that would be great. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Uh, and then I, uh, unless there's any other questions, I don't see any hands raised. So I'm going to say no, although if you have one, interrupt me. Um, so I, I was first going to say on side 25, it's great to see that, uh, you know, that you've been following the, the scientific Python uh, org recommendations and uh, this battery of uh, best practices. So fantastic to see that. Uh, so good job being a leader there. And then my, my actual kind of question, though, is back more on slide, uh, well, a bit on 24, but more on 16, or I think, yeah, 16, where you talked about using Snakemake. Uh, and we're, we're starting to see workflow languages and engines uh, pop up more and more across uh, high energy physics in general. Um, from uh, and snake make seems to be kind of a recurring one that comes up uh, again and again for for good reason given its uh, prevalence in the broader scientific python community uh, i was going to ask if you just had maybe like a one minute summary of um, how you found the adoption inside the experiment uh, both in terms of like any technical challenges uh, or technical benefits uh, as well as uh, any sort of sociological challenges, because uh, I know sometimes when it takes a bit of a mental mind shift when people are uh, when people are building um, their analysis uh, pipelines uh, to try and get into the, the get into the mindset of thinking in a workflow engine rather than uh, just kind of doing, um, if you will, exploratory development. So I think that really the main winning point of using snake make here for us is the uh, how well it is it, it's really uh, it integrates with with the existing python software okay so to me what the winning point is being able to write these workflow uh, files by directly calling in uh, whatever your uh, routines in python that so that this makes it really interesting and really readable and and easy to to maintain from this point of view I would say. Um, so, of course, so I'm not sure how good Snake Make scales up to the experiments that, that deal with the data sets that are much larger than the one fields in, in Legend or, or let's say, uh, workflows that are much more complicated. This I, I, I don't know, honestly. Uh, it's certainly for our application. I mean, we also have. Um, a lot of, I mean, this, this works so will really get huge for us, uh, uh, but so it, it, it has proven, let's say, to work rather well and to be very nice. So at the moment, this is really, we use this um, for data production. So this sort of official data production and the official data production, uh, simulations production. So it's being run from, let's say, a very small group of people uh, that that are expert on this, and it's not at the moment. It's not really used by the users. Let's say even if if we foresee that functionality. So um, I mean, for us was was like quite natural to use this also because in the for in the past experiments we were using a workflow manager that that is called uh, Luigi, and it was developed by Spotify, and was also uh, I have no experience with it, but I also was Python. And, and so maybe for us, the, the jump, let's say, from there to here was, was not so uh, complicated. Uh, and yeah, so these are, let's say, my feel. I, I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, uh, yeah, no, that, that was a perfect answer. So thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's uh, thank.